Now, please join me and welcome Ms. Denise Lee, partner at McKinsey. The topic of her talk today is global AI ecosystem and the catalyst for transformation. Welcome, Ms. Lee. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. I'm very happy and honored to join you today and talk about a very exciting opportunity. I've really learned a lot from the previous speakers from Emily, Robert, and also our um, first uh, speaker. And I feel very promising after listening to the talks. And a lot of uh, new faces here today, so can you do me a favor, close your eyes. I will ask you a question and raise your hand uh, to answer my question. After today's forum, raise your hand if you think AI is a very potential um, topic or area. Raise your hand if you think that AI is in overhype. Fantastic. Now, please open your eyes. Uh, the results I saw, um, I believe you can guess already. No one raised their hands out in my second question. So I do see that everyone recognized the potential of AI. And next, I will share some of the perspectives from McKinsey on AI. First, to McKinsey, we do see a lot of impact coming from AI in the future. In 2018, we published a report on advanced analytics and AI. After that report, Gen AI and a lot of computing power were developed. So the potential in terms of dollar value continued to grow. The estimation right now is 17 trillion US dollar and above. So what does that represent? In 2024, global GDP is $110 trillion. Last uh, GDP in Taiwan is 0.8 uh, trillion US dollars. So $17 trillion is really high. This comes from uh, value from uh, Gen AI and also from productivity growth. A further dive into possible impact from Gen AI. What this chart shows is how Gen AI can impact different sector in terms of productivity growth. The highest impact is in the tech industry, but to be specific, the tech here means software industry. The second sector to be impacted the most is retail, followed by banking. And um, what we will talk about is here, um, advanced electronics and um, semiconductor. So overall, Gen AI, we believe, can bring very strong productivity growth. It's really worth expe expecting. And uh, the technology evolves rapidly as well. At the end of last year, and all the way until the time that I made this presentation, we already saw many new applications. For example, the uh, to the Grok 200,000 GPU, the OpenAI O3 upgrade, the DeepSeq um, cost reduction. So this, all of these shows that uh, this is a really lively domain and it changes really quick. Let's further think about the implication of these changes. First, on cost. Cost is declining across the board. The cost for training is continue to drop. In terms of training, in terms of influencing, we see the drop comes in um, a very high multiples. On the right hand side is uh, improvement in capability. I make two um, more common use cases. One is MI, um, ME, ME, which is performing really well in the USA mass um, Olympiad qualifier. The other is the 90 percent percentile score in the U.S. bar exam. You already see AI improving a lot in those two exams. And where is the value from AI? Emily show us a chart on different players of AI. I have a similar chart here as well. From right-hand side, semiconductor, its design, its manufacturing to device manufacturers. To the middle 
section with data center, uh, including data center system, utility provider, software, server, and apps provider. There are a lot of players in the data center ecosystem. A lot of players need to come together to really build the AI that we're looking for. I have an even more detailed chart to show you later. But this simply shows you how different players need to chip in to really deliver the value of AI. In terms of value chain, a lot of the value chain can already be identified in the software side. And in the hardware side, we are seeing some um, outliers, including NVIDIA and Weying. There are great players here. They're, and also that's why you see large increase in their valuation. But AI is still evolving. There's still a lot of potential in terms of hardware. Looking at the data centers, for example, we know that due to the huge in, um, potential of AI, people continue to invest in data center. These four major companies, for example, the CapEx they're planning is in together uh, in total more than 300 billion US dollar. What does that mean? It means that the um, number of data centers across the world will continue to grow by 21 percent all the way until 2030. And you, if you look at the white chart, it, re, it means the workload increased by AI. And the Gen AI percentage is shown in the blue circles. So this show us the span of data center driven by AI is immeasurable. So what's the implication in compute, in power, in cooling, in network and uh, memory? And at many, in many other areas, we see opportunities for innovation. I just list a few. There are a lot more. Take compute, for example, GPU, CPU, ASIC. And maybe in the future, well, there will be uh, inference-specific uh, customer uh, metrics. And also, the second category is power on rack level architecture. In terms of the third category, cooling, we talked about air cooling and emerging new cooling system um, now has piqued a lot of interest. And moving on to ne the network uh, possibility, we will see growth in uh, transmission to make sure that um, the transmission intro data centers can um, produce very good quality. And finally, on memory, high band uh, memory is something that we all know very well. I will talk each of them in detail. Previous speakers talked about the importance of computing power. I want to also touch upon uh, influence workload. It's a key environment, a key element. We know by 2030, uh, the influence uh, workload will, will continue to dry, to grow very quickly. We did a survey uh, with CSP, non-CSP, and startups. We see that they continue to think about um, trade-offs between um, computing and influence. We see that in the enterprises, the percentage of influence continue to go up. They're the main driver for the influencing power. And in training, reasoning, influence, and interactive inferences, we are seeing different choices of optimizing for TCO and um, performance. And we know that merging GPU is still the key application uh, driver for application. But in um, in ASIC, we are seeing um, customer metrics uh, growing with potential. In diff uh, we are looking also at different hyperscalers, which see the same custom ASICs continue to go up with uh, enterprise um, as spends. If you look back to 2024, all the way until 2030, custom ASICs still has a lot of potential of growth. Next, I want to talk about power. We all we touched upon the importance of power management. We also agree. We think that power will be the number one bottleneck in the future. So how do you read this chart? You go from the bottom uh, yellow line and to the upper yellow line. That is the expected increase of computing power. So when you go from the bottom up, the first bottleneck is the power constraint. So when uh, the power grow by um, 10,000 times, we will first hit this uh, bottleneck. It's 
It's the first one before time, uh, before any other um, challenges. So this is uh, shown or seen already in the U.S. For example, in some markets, uh, primary data center markets like Northern Virginia, Dallas, Dallas and uh, Phoenix are these are the original key markets of data center. But in the future, Salt Lake City, Denver, Oklahoma, and Kansas are the new potential markets. Why? Because in those areas, you will be able to get access to better power infrastructure. Another uh, information I want to add is that the transformation and distribution system in the U.S. is still improving. The supply chain is seeing the same thing as well. In uh, generator, UPS or uh, transformer switchboard and chillers are seeing longer delay as well. Why? This means that the overall data center and the power infrastructure uh, installment needs um, efforts, and that means business opportunities. In terms of power, Emily also mentioned that um, the increase in power density requires better cooling solution. We are seeing more demand in cooling solutions. So here are some numbers to support that. In term, in the data center side, the uh, air and liquid, uh, liquid cooling, uh, we are seeing bigger, stronger growth more than 40% uh, hacker growth. And behind that, there are a lot of um, options you can look at, including direct-to-chip form immersion, single phase, full phase. It depends on the uh, density at rack level to come to choose the best option. And in, uh, th in this area, we are seeing a lot of innovation and we are seeing a lot of players working together in the ecosystem to come up with new solutions. Some examples here. Uh, one of them is EMS to cooling. Second one is chips to cooling. The third one is server to cooling. And the fourth fourth one is power to cool power um, powerful cooling. And the last one is cooling to cooling. A lot of players are coming in to create innovation. So a lot of potential here. I also mentioned the importance of network. And so just quickly touch upon that in terms of higher bandwidth transmission. Uh, this is a great uh, insight here. From 2025 to 2029, we are going to see a big change that is the adoption of 1.6T. And that is something worth paying attention to. So um, when we combine all these trends together, we see that the ecosystem um, will be impacted. A lot of the players will uh, be impacted from compute IT hardware to power uh, support uh, vendors. But I also want to talk about site selection, MEP, data center software, and uh, other services, and also sustainability partners are um, very important, indispensable as well. So overall, we are seeing a lot of opportunities, and we want all the partners in the ecosystem to work together so we can further drive potential of AI. So if we take a step back, we know that AI has a lot of potential, but we also see that in different businesses, in different enterprise, um, some adopts AI a lot, some not so much. 90% of the companies said that they need to invest more in analytics. They need to do more in terms of trans digital transformation. But out of them, only 30% to 25% expected off lift, uh, uplift in revenue and cost have been realized. So that's a pain point for a lot of enterprises. They're seeing beautiful pictures in the future, but it seems to be a distant picture, difficult to reach. So is this the same with Gen AI? This is a survey conducted uh, at the end of last year for about 200 big companies in the US. 90% of respondents said that they are starting to use Gen AI, but you can also see that out of them, most of them are in the pilot stage, which means that they're still experimenting it. They haven't seen real value yet. Only the 1% on the right-hand side said that their Gen AI capability is more mature now, and they're using more mature application. 
why we look into this and we uh, if we look back at cloud adoption are there some lessons we can learn if you look back in the cloud adoption there are a few key points first the challenges usually comes from the fact that a lot of these innovation or adoption were IT led. And this means that the adoption is uh, irrelevant to different to other business units. So IT was driving very hard, but other business units were not willing to adopt. The second challenge was that even though there were great application and cloud solutions, but the fundamental business process stays the same. So the way people work, their processes, their approval um, procedures are the same. So the tools are available, but, did, but the tools are not generating value. So the uh, tools should be zero-based design, so it can be deployed faster and deliver true value. The third challenge we are seeing from the cloud adoption is a lack of talents. And the fourth challenge was change management mentality. A lot of times it was not the problem was the way you work, but it was uh, the problem was with implementation of change. So. Uh, change management was usually the hurdle for driving new change. So these were the challenges in driving cloud technology. So maybe uh, these challenges are the same with AI adoption. So that means businesses need to ad adopt new mindset. Uh, we further look at the cloud adoption process. We saw that from the uh, left and left hand side to the right right hand side. This is the ROI for uh, from uh, uh, edge to cloud. If you only put a lot of uh, a little data in cloud or a little workload in cloud, you won't reach a real ROI. Uh, so there's a sweet spot here. Only when you use cloud much enough will you reach the sweet spot and i think the same main goes to ai as well so each company needs to think about how much workload should be incorporated with ai to generate real value this slide is um about how i am optimistic about ai adoption we still need to learn and i talked about how 90 percent are, of people are using uh, Gen AI. A lot of businesses are also seeing how AI can or is already delivering good ROI for them. So I have a quick summary here. First, AI do hold immense promise for global economy. I think uh, previous speakers all talked about, about this but I want to stress how big the potential can be. And this business opportunity will attract a lot of investments in the future. And in these investments, we will see uh, the need of information in different areas of the ecosystem to deliver real return. That means business opportunities for you. And the third key point is that if you want to do something different for as a company, if you want to come up with new business method uh, and uh, productivity growth, there are five suggestions McKinsey have for you. Uh, that These are lessons we get from cloud adoption. I have three final questions for you. First. How is your organization enabling the AI ecosystem and capturing the growth opportunity? Second question for you is how is your organization rewiring to reap the productivity benefits? Final question, how is your organization considering change management and mitigating risks in terms of security, privacy, and so on? These are my final points for you. Thank you so much.